Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and in each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical practice and clinical research, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration on your healing journey. Today, I have a repeat guest that has been one of the podcast's absolute favorites. Um, if you've been around for a while, you have absolutely heard um, our special, it's a kind of a special edition because we share slides. We go really, really, really deep. Um, just super, super excited to have Bob Miller back on the podcast. Um, Bob is a traditional naturopath specializing in the field of genetic specific nutrition. In 1993, he opened Tree of Life Practice and has served as a traditional nat naturopath for 27 years. For the past several years, he's engaged exclusively with functional nutritional genetic variants and related research specializing in nutritional support for those with chronic Lyme disease um, and many other chronic illnesses. We always relate so well because it's the same type of practice and patients that I see every day in clinical practice um, to support his growing genetic research efforts. In 2015, he funded and founded uh, genetic Nutri sorry, Nutra Genetic Research Institute to research the relationship between genetic variants and presenting symptoms. So today, guys, um, stay tuned, hold on to your hats. If you are driving, uh, don't stop the car, keep listening, but you may want to come back and actually look at the YouTube episode because we're going to share some visual um, effects. We'll try to, I'll try to just comment if there's something that you can't see that, that would be helpful. But otherwise, wherever you're listening, you will find this information profoundly transformative and today will be no different. Today, our topic is super oxide and could this be the root cause of your inflammation? Welcome, Bob. <laughs> Always good to be back. Always a pleasure to be with you. As I said before we started, we get so much feedback. People say the way they appreciate the way the two of us uh, talk back and forth and uh, enjoy how we communicate together. So looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I'd encourage everybody to put their seatbelts on because we're going to uh, we're going to move along with some really cool stuff. Yeah. So go ahead and share your screen, Bob, and jump right in. And we'll do like we always do. I'm going to put you on speaker view. So whichever one of us is speaking, you guys will see us and. We're going to um, dive right in, and I'll just let you get started. Okay. You see the slide there that says superoxide? See that okay? That's great. Okay. This topic is superoxide. Is this the root cause of your inflammation? Now, if any of you are a health professional, you know, you, you're like superoxide. There's nothing new about that. We've been talking about that for a very long time, and we certainly have. And I started talking about it probably 20 years ago, but as we dug a little deeper, you'll be going to be surprised how uh, significant this is. And of course, we always mention this is informational and educational purposes. We're not giving any advice on how to treat any disease. So here's what we're going to do. We want to look at superoxide 101 and the damage from it. Uh, how excess superoxide creates many health concerns that I wasn't aware of. Then we're going to look at all the pathways of making superoxide. Then we're going to look at the pathways of reducing superoxide. And of course, we always like to give some practical steps if this is something that you think that uh, that you would like to address. Uh, just first want to mention uh, it's the people who helped this happen. It's just not me. Uh, Matthew Miller, he's the head of research, has his master's degree in pharmacogenomics from Manchester University, in case you're wondering. Yes, that is my son. And uh, Dr. Harold Landis, great guy. Uh, he had graduated from the University of Maryland Dental School and is a fellow in integrative medicine from the University of Arizona. And many times we're still uh, emailing each other studies at uh, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning as we say, isn't this cool? So uh, now I also think we need to honor the pioneers, uh, the people who have come before us who have done some of this work. And I've really come to appreciate biochemist Erwin Fredovich, and he's from the James B. Duke uh, School of Medicine. He was Professor Emeritus of Medicine, and uh, he was there from 1929 to 2019. He's passing at the age of 90. This guy published more than 500 academic papers. Dr. Jill, how in the world do you publish 500 papers? Unbelievable. And I love that you're honoring these people because um, it is it's so, so much of this research is leading us to these new um, discoveries, but so awesome to honor the people who've come before Absolutely. And he uh, had wrote uh, one article that was uh, cited more than 51,000 times, and he opened up an entirely new field of medicine and biology devoted to oxygen-free radicals. Now, here's the guy, 
at 85 years old, still lecturing at Duke University. So, Dr. Joe, that's one of my own personal goals, still lecturing at 85. We'll see if we can do that. Um, but he came up with the superoxide. of historical time that's a that's a blip yeah but he said that superoxide is the origin of most reactive oxygen species and that it undergoes a chain reaction in the cell playing a central role in the reactive oxygen species producing system and then he went on to say you'll see at the bottom of the slide that mitochondrial manganese SUD enzymes is your essential defense against that superoxide and that's because mitochondria is the major source of your superoxide. So wow. it was based upon this that we started uh, looking at our uh, at our research. And you can see here that uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and other neurological diseases are caused by abnormalities in our biological defenses or increased intracellular reactive oxygen levels. Now, we're going to get down to real basics here, Dr. Jim. What is superoxide? And people are going to say, that's it. So you're looking at the screen there, you'll see oxygen to the left, it's two oxygen atoms, the little blue, the little blue dots. And by the way, do you see my cursor and what we're doing here? Okay, we do. Yes, it looks great. Yeah. So the um, these little blue dots are the electrons and they need to be paired and you can see they're all paired up. Well, what happens with superoxide is an electron comes in and attaches by itself and that's what creates all the trouble. So to me, it's kind of amazing that we're talking about one tiny little electron sticking on there and creating all the problems we're going to talk about. So here's um, what manganese SOD does. So we thought we'd give you an idea of what, what that does. So you'll see here I'm pointing to superoxide. And then manganese comes along. Now, this is not magnesium. This is manganese. And it's got a three plus charge. It takes on that uh, that extra electron and turns it back into oxygen. How cool! Then you'll see that that uh, manganese two plus combines with two hydrogens and turns it into hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide can create problems inside the body, but we do have incredible mechanisms to get rid of this. The body makes something called catalase that will turn the hydrogen peroxide into oxygen. Glutathione, there's an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase 1 that uses glutathione to turn it into water, and something called thriadoxin. And by the way, we could probably do a whole uh, podcast on thriadoxin sometime, how that turns hydrogen peroxide into water as well. And as you can imagine, you can have genetic mutations on SOD2 that makes it not as effective. You can have genetic mutations on catalase, glutathione peroxidase 1, or thriadoxin, that it may not do its job as well as it should. So if we don't clear that hydrogen peroxide, there's something called the Fenton reaction that takes Fe2 and turns it into Fe3 and makes hydroxyl radicals that we're going to talk about a little later. But these are bad guys who do a lot of trouble because they oxidize and damage your lipids. So do you see Bob, how- I have a quick question for you as you sure. go. My thought is one thing you and I both love is breathing our hydrogen. And a lot of people, patients do tabs that are hydrogen. And I'm suspecting there's a place for that as in this pathway, as far as neutralizing um, the reactive oxygen. Is that true? Would that just come in and add a hydrogen in any particular place here? Or is that more a generalized reaction that can neutralize radicals? We, uh, we've we talked about that among our crew. And we do believe this is like the, uh, the hydrogen you breathe or the hydrogen you take. So Got it. Um, I'm not surprised you caught that, by the way, based on <laughs> good, uh, good catch. But that's why that hydrogen water or breathing hydrogen can be so uh, can okay. be so effective. But then it looks like if you had SOD mutations, you might still maybe not, I mean, probably would benefit from the hydrogen, but maybe not as much because you still require the SOD in there, right? Absolutely. Like yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. 
Yep. Now we're going to show what happens if we don't have SOD. We'll show that in a little bit. Now, this is a chart that I made up that illustrates the damage that superoxide can do. Now, we're not talking about diseases or conditions. We're just talking about what it can make that's uh, oxidizing. And it was fun to make this chart. So one of the things that uh, superoxide will do, it will combine with nitric oxide. Now, I know, Dr. Joe, you're a big fan of nitric oxide. I hear you speak about it. And you talk about all the benefits of it. And that's all absolutely true. But we lose those benefits if superoxide combines to make something called peroxynitrite. Yes. Now, we could talk about peroxynitrite, but what I'd encourage you to do is go back to one of our old videos, number 16, where we spoke about uh, peroxynitrite. But the cliff notes is peroxynitrite is capable of initiating DNA single-strand breakage, leading to eventual severe energy depletion of the cells and necrotic-type cell death. By the way, it's interesting, the, the chemical symbols. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, peroxynitrite is not done there yet. We need to uh, to make nitric oxide, and this is a very simplified version, but there's, there's an enzyme called NOS, and there's actually three of them, but for simplicity, I just put one here. And it uses arginine plus other things, and it makes nitric oxide. But it's dependent upon BH4. And BH4 turns into BH2, and BH2 has to be recycled back to BH4. And again, simplified drawing here, but if we're just running off BH2, rather than making nitric oxide, we make superoxide. And then that comes up here and just creates a, a feedback loop. And we're in, uh, we're in serious trouble as this thing just feeds upon itself. Now, additionally, that BH4 is needed to make dopamine and serotonin, and serotonin also goes into to melatonin, and peroxynitrite inhibits that process. Mm -hmm. So you can see there, Dr. Jill, how we get into this, this loop of inflammation. That makes so much sense. And we've talked before in that previous episode about BH4, the importance, the sources and that, because that can be one of those things, but it's not just as easy as taking BH4 because it doesn't come that easily um, to our bodies. It sure doesn't. We have a, another chart. We're going to look at that. Now, the other thing that uh, peroxynitrite does, it inhibits manganese SOD2. What we just mm -hmm. showed you that takes care of that, peroxynitrite will inhibit it by something called nitration of one of the amino acids. And we'll have another slide that shows that even more. Now, if that's not enough, it gets involved over here. But first, let's look at what happens there. So here's your manganese SOD, as we just showed. And the superoxide will turn into oxygen. Good thing. Then it flips and makes hydrogen peroxide. And then, as we said, that can combine with iron to make hydroxyl radicals. And that, you know, it makes your uh, lipid peroxides, it takes your lipids and oxidizes them and does cell membrane damage. Here we have just a little description. It's the most reactive oxygen radical known. It may cause lipid peroxidation and destroy cell membranes. It reacts with almost every type of molecule found in living cells, including sugars, amino acids, phospholipids, DNA, organic acids, and fatty acids. One nasty molecule. Mm. Now, look who will help with that BH4. But look what peroxynitrite does. Yes. It inhibits your BH4. So you can see we've got multiple things going on here. Now, we're going to talk later about manganese. It's a very important mineral. And we're going to talk to you later about how glyphosate may be impacting this. And if we run out of manganese, SOD2 keeps working but it uses iron. Mm. That if was one we, of my original questions. I'm sure you'll go into that, but I have seen on testing patients who are manganese deficient more than ever before. And I, like you have suspected chemicals and glyphosate in the mix. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about what do we do when we don't have that element? Absolutely. Yeah, we have that later on in the presentation. So if we're excess in iron, that will go into side two. We have another slide on this as well then it just makes your hydrogen peroxide. So you don't get the oxygen, you just get more hydroxyl radicals. 
And as these lipids get damaged, it's called ferroptosis. And this is a new form of cell death that results from iron accumulation in the cells. It depletes antioxidant enzymes, resulting in lipid peroxidation and more oxidative stress. And we're going to have more slides on this, but there's something called the electron transport chain. And what that does, it takes these electrons and they just be bopped down through here and they make ATP. Now, what's interesting, they're dependent upon um, iron sulfur clusters, as it's called. And Dr. Jill, we could probably do a whole show on, on this one sometime because it's fascinating, an area we're digging into. But unfortunately, when we get uh, too much hydrogen peroxide or superoxide, this iron can actually be ripped off to make this hydroxyl radical. And if we don't have iron sulfur clusters, rather than make ATP, hang on to your hat, we make more superoxide. Oh boy. Yeah. So not so, only does that damage cell membranes, it also steals from the, the mitochondria that are making this um, energy. Yes. So, I mean, there's many reasons for fatigue. This isn't the only one, but this could be a big reason why people have no fatigue. They have exercise intolerance mm -hmm. because they're not making enough adenyl triphosphate. That's the fuel that makes your, your body go. In a little while, we're going to show you a whole chart that shows you how these are made and, uh, and what can go wrong. And at the uh, end of this uh, podcast, we're actually going to show Jill's, uh, Dr. Jill's genome She's brave enough to, again, let everyone see her genome. So congratulations on that. <laughs> and we're going to show you that you may not be the best producer of these uh, iron sulfur clusters, my friend. No surprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, this, may be of, uh, this may be of benefit uh, to you. And then finally, superoxide can, again, as it destroys those iron sulfur clusters, can affect your amino acid biosynthesis. So... I was pretty amazed as I started going through and looking all the ways that can hurt us. And I have a sneaking suspicion this isn't everything. I have a sneaking suspicion there's uh, there's more. Uh, just a real quick slide on ferroptosis. It's oxidative damage to the cell membrane leading to cell death. And it's when you don't have that uh, repair with the glutathione peroxidase 4. It's iron dependent, distinct from apoptosis or necrosis. And it plays an important role in the development of various inflammation-related diseases, such as autism. So we're going to be um, uh, in the um, in the fall and spring of uh, 25. I'm going to be speaking at some autism conferences with an emphasis on um, ferroptosis being a, a player in that. Uh, here's just a uh, a more simplified version. Here's your polyunsaturated fatty acids, iron, hydrogen peroxide makes reactive oxygen species then damages your lipid peroxides, ferroptosis, cell membrane damage. Glutathione peroxidase 4 is dependent upon glutathione. GSH is the symbol for glutathione. And there's one pathogenic SNP, uh, this one right here. Then when you've got a mutation on this one, your GPX4 may not be working as well as it should. In case anyone's not familiar what we mean by a SNP, it means when, when you were conceived, when the sperm entered the egg, your DNA pattern was made. And, and we can get what are called genetic SNPs or mutations or wild, whatever you'd like to call them, where the enzyme that this makes isn't as effective. It's still working. It still gets turned off and on, but it's not as effective. So in this example here, one parent gave a mutation on GPX4 and sometimes two parents do. And if this GPX4 is weak and you make lipid peroxides, you're going to have less ability to turn that lipid peroxide in that lipid alcohol, more opportunity to go over to ferroptosis. Uh, just as a clinical observation, we see a lot of leaky gut uh, with this because the, the gut lining is being uh, impacted. Now here is a um, slightly expanded version. Now you might say, no wait, I, I saw this over here before you, you did. Now, what we added to it was there's an enzyme called tumor necrosis factor alpha, where mycotoxins are mold, excess iron, lipopolysaccharides, virus, Borrelia, glyphosate, and clostridia will overstimulate tumor necrosis factor. Stimulates the NADPH oxidase enzyme, 
makes your superoxide. Things we talked about before, Fenton reaction, but on here we show you that the Fe2 plus is called ferrous iron. This is what uh, can bind your oxygen. Your Fe3, this is your ferric non-functional and cannot bind oxygen. So that's what happens the more this Fenton reaction occurs. Then we get those lipid peroxides, as we just spoke about. But here we show that uh, CoQ10 is important. BH4 helps calm this down. Glutathion peroxidase 4 that we just showed you. And that comes from uh, glutathione. Now, we can have something we can have something called the NMDA receptor that we'll talk about later. Stimulated by glyphosate, homocysteine, high fructose corn syrup, electromagnetic fields, thalates, and arsenic that will uh, increase the glutamate, which can inhibit your body's ability to bring cysteine into the cell to make glutathione. So another three-ring circus here, Dr. Jill, how these can all interplay and they're all just uh, compound each other. And this would be why some individuals might be inflamed and they can't figure out why despite whatever they try to do. Makes sense. Now, here's a couple conditions related to ferroptosis. I'm not going to read all of them. Just the, the, uh, the category, nervous system, cardiovascular, bones, pancreas, kidneys, gastrointestinal, liver, lungs, and the eyes. They can all be affected by ferroptosis. And interesting, they're now doing studies. Their study elucidated that in, there's an intricate correlation between ferroptosis and autism and provides a promising ferroptosis score model to mm -hmm. predict the molecular clusters and immune infiltration cell profiles of the children with autism spectrum disorder. And clearly, I mean, this uh, problem is just increasing dramatically. Um, you know, the, the amount of children that now are diagnosed with autism is going up. Yes. Our genetics haven't changed, mm -hmm. but our environment has. Yeah, it's the elephant in the room, that environmental toxic load and so many of the things you showed in the slide previously is just really increasing glyphosate and uh, arsenic and all of those types of things. Absolutely. Now, we're going to get into a little bit about just what mitochondrial superoxide can do. It plays a critical role in Alzheimer's disease, again, increasing that dramatically. What a, what a horrible illness that uh, takes people... Uh, takes their mind away. They don't know who they are anymore. So they were able to show that increasing the expression of the mitochondrial antioxidant SOD2 prevents memory deficits and the plaque deposition that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. So a lot to be studied there. Diabetic complications. The metabolic abnormalities of diabetes cause mitochondrial superoxide overproduction in the cells of both large and small vessels and also in the mitocardium. This causes the activation of five major pathways involved in the complications. Interestingly, orally administrated SOD, that's the superoxide mm -hmm. dismutase, can exhibit glucose lowering effects by targeting the intestine of diabetic rats and the uh, lipopolysaccharide influx. Now, as we said, this is a manganese SOD, that's the manganese SOD. Now there's there's three of them, but we're talking about the SOD2. Um, so they're talking about inhibits the growth of androgen-independent prostate cancer cells. Arteriosclerosis, I mean, clearly heart disease is at the top of the list of conditions we have. Excessive generation of reactive oxygen species leads to a state of oxidative stress, which is the major risk factor for the development and progression of arteriosclerosis. As we spoke earlier, Enos and ethylene nitric oxide can become uncoupled. And then superoxide reacts with nitric, nitric oxide to form peroxynitrite, which oxidizes the BH4, leading to BH4 deficiency. And once again, we're just on a, a merry-go-round here, Dr. Jill, of, uh, of inflammation and, uh, and heart disease. So we even have a problem here with, uh, with cataracts. Oxidative stress plays an important role in the onset and progression of cataracts. And here we have um, age-related macular degeneration. The low glutathione peroxidase activity and antioxidant status are associated with advanced uh, macular degeneration. The antioxidant enzymes and serum total antioxidant status could be a promising marker 
for the prediction. And of course, as we get older, especially for women, their bones becoming uh, brittle and intracellular redox imbalance caused by SOD1 deficiency plays a pivotal role in the development of bone, bone fragility in, uh, in individuals. I want to just pause there, Bob, and say, I mean, I think that osteoporosis, osteopenia, bone loss, a lot of women don't know that this is very inflammatory driven. And I think this is a really important point, just that you might think, oh, it's my age or I'm not exercising enough and all that's important or eating enough minerals or uh, low stomach acid. There's many other things that relate, but really at the root, a lot of these things that we don't suspect inflammation is the root. So I love that you're bringing this all together, especially with bone health. Like I said, many women, I don't think understand the connection between inflammation and loss of bone. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because clearly calcium is important. But for too long of a time, if somebody has osteoporosis, all they do is they think they have to take more calcium. Yes. And uh, and that's not working very well. Exactly. And, uh, and it, interestingly, we'll show a little bit later, if the NMDA is upregulated, excess calcium can actually create inflammation. As backwards as that sound. I know that flies in the face of everything we've ever heard. But um, uh, again, not saying that you don't want calcium or take calcium. But if we get too much and NMDA is upregulated, it can actually create oxidative stress. Um, this is talking about the um, skin aging. Oxidative stress is a consequence of an imbalance in prooxidants and antioxidants has been demonstrated in the aged skin. And finally, increased superoxide in heart failure. A mechanism responsible for impaired endothelial function in heart failure is enhanced by a degradation of nitric oxide by the superoxide and you know, again i know that's a, one of your favorite subjects the, yes. uh, the the nitric oxide and when they uh, combine with each other they have a diffusion limited radical reaction to form the peroxynitrite anion now this is interesting in autism sod expression was found to be decreased during brain samples doing a a meta analysis then uh, even here's another one. Our data suggests that decreased serum SOD levels can be implicated in the progression of autism in children and can be used as an independent risk indicator of autism spectrum disorder. And here again, finally on this, they're talking about um, the former hypothesis where you're talking about uh, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species is now a certainty in autism. So they're talking about superoxide, hydroxyl radical, hydrogen peroxide, singlet oxygen, nitric oxide being used improperly, and peroxynitrite, respectfully. They overwhelm the cellular buffing systems and may lead to cellular injury. So even we're talking now about um, adult uh, ADD, ADHD, and I just saw a statistic that among children, one out of nine children have ADHD. This is a wow. This is a tragedy. It is. And I'm sure you've been in practice for a while. I'm sure you're seeing it among your, your patients. That uh, Are you seeing a rise in people that have ADD, ADHD, at, uh, and they're having a hard time focusing and concentrating? Absolutely. And yes, the kids are increasing in incidence, both autism and ADD and all kinds of neuroinflammatory disorders. However, the adults, same way. I would say I'm actually seeing just as much of a rise later in life with adults really suffering from um, maybe something they've suffered with their whole life, but at least the prevalence in clinical practice is increasing pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're, we're seeing it here as well, that um, yeah. people have a hard time concentrating. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's even in uh, Crohn's disease, which again is an, an autoimmune, and they're talking about there's a relationship between oxidative stress and antioxidant defense in Crohn's disease. So here is the... Um, in pain, superoxide anion wow. is overproduced in joint inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. It leads to tissue damage, degeneration, and pain. And in these conditions, the defense against superoxide, which you all now know, superoxide dismutase, mm -hmm. is decreased. No, uh, no great surprise there, Dr. Jill. Now, how do we make this superoxide? So here we go. There isn't just one way. We're going to talk about uh, any uh, NOx uncoupling by genetic and epigenetic factors, NOx, the electron transport chain, overaction of NMDA, glutathione not recycling properly, something called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, and 
polyaromatic hydrocarbons creating superoxide. And I remember us talking, well, one of our uh, recordings was one of the times that you were having the uh, the fires in uh, in Colorado. I don't remember what that was, but we discussed how so many people were uh, were struggling yes because all those uh, all those all that smoke was uh, in some individuals more than others creating all this um, superoxide when when was that do you remember that would have been about 2 years ago um time flies when we're having fun <laughs> one of the thought is something i check tnf alpha all the time in my mold patients but as you elucidated earlier it could be caused by multiple insults infections and toxins and one thing I saw in the wildfires was that people were looking, their blood work was looking just like someone who had had an acute mold exposure. And of course we knew this, but it was just showing that it's so many of the environmental chemicals that upregulate. And that makes sense in this case as well. Absolutely. Now, if anyone's interested in what I'm going to talk about right now, go back to our uh, our interview, the Carnahan reaction and INOS, where we talked about how Dr. Jill has an interesting pattern and you'll see this when we look at her genome, of the NOS2 enzyme being a little overactive. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because you can just watch the video. We had a lot of fun on that one. Yes. But, but here's what happens. There's a NOS3 enzyme or endothelial nitric oxide synthase that makes nitric oxide, again, this is a gas that dilates our blood vessels. Everything you've heard about, it's absolutely true. So we need it desperately. That's why some people need to take uh, nitroglycerin. That's why men would use Viagra Cialis to get the nitric oxide for blood flow. We need BH4, NADPH, and arginine to make the nitric oxide. NOS3 does that. Things like nitrates help that along, like your beets. Now, here you'll see the BH4. There's ways the BH4 gets made. And all these purple circles are enzymes that are made by your DNA. For example, if someone has mutations in their MTHFRE1298, they may not make as much BH4. And interestingly, one of the things that helps with that is royal jelly. It's a naturally occurring source of, uh, of BH4. Oh, fascinating. Because we were talking before, I, I felt like it's kind of difficult to come up with sources purely for that. I did not know about the royal jelly. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we probably, uh, in, in our you know health consulting, we probably... One out of five people, we suggest uh, royal jelly. And uh, one, of, one of the funny things is we, when we deal with young ladies, we tell them, now, you're going to have to be careful. Everyone's going to have to now address you as princess. And that's when they get older. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right. Then uh, also when uh, GDP guanatine triphosphate, that comes down through here through all these enzymes and makes BH4 as well. Again, mutations here can impact us. And here you'll see mercury, lead, aluminum, iron, sometimes too high of a protein diet, hydrogen peroxide, high ammonia, peroxynitrite, sun ultraviolet can suppress this. Now, one of my favorite sayings is NOS2 is your friend unless it isn't. <laughs> In other words, this is there to create extra high levels of nitric oxide if we need to kill some pathogen. So if we've got a bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasite, NOS2 will kick in and create extra to create a little bit of oxidative stress. But if this guy is overactive, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think I had the, the, the slide, I should have put in this one, but I forgot. Uh, COVID-19 uh, overstimulates the NOS2 and suppresses the NOS3, possibly leading to the, uh, to the endothelial issues and the, and the clotting. But bottom line here is, if we run out of BH4 or some other things here, rather than making nitric oxide, you're going to make superoxide. And then that will combine with nitric oxide if we don't have enough SOD and make peroxynitrite, which further suppresses your BH4. And the circus begins of just feeding yeah. upon itself. All right, now here's another one. And by the way, we did another recording number 26 about the NOx enzyme. NADPH oxidase is one of my favorite enzymes. Again, I've said this before, NOx is your friend unless it isn't. So this is part of your immune system response. So when we're faced with something we need to, to kill, NOx makes superoxide to kill the pathogen and it can stimulate mast cells. That's okay unless it's overactive. Yes. 
Now, Dr. Joe, you've been practicing a little while. How much has mast cell activation increased from when you started to what you're seeing now? Massively. There may not be another condition that I see more of an increase in clinical practice. It was almost unheard of when I graduated from medical school. And the only thing we were taught in medical school was mastocytosis, which is the proliferation in the bone marrow, almost like a precancerous condition that is very different from mast cell activation. Um, in mast cell activation, it's the normal primordial immune cells that are defense against, but many, many people nowadays are having overreactive mast cells. And it leads to a host of illnesses and symptoms in all tissues from the cardiovascular symptom to the brain, to the skin, to the gut, uh, pretty much any system you could name, I could tell you a mast cell effect. So thank you for bringing that up because I know a lot of people listening know someone or have heard of this or they're searching for information. It's a really big deal. Absolutely. Now, we talk, you talked earlier about the TNFA, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Again, this is your friend unless it isn't. Yes. And here you can see there's two RS numbers, uh, two SNPs that when they're mutated, they're considered gain of function. In other words, when they're stimulated by some pathogen, mm -hmm. they overreact. So again, mycotoxins, virus, lipopolysaccharides, clostridia, glyphosate, Borrelia, probably more, they will stimulate the tumor necrosis factor. If this, if you have the SNP that it's overactive, it over responds, stimulates, knocks. Now, in addition to this pathway, there's an enzyme called SIRT1 that holds it back. Probably figured there you can have a mutation, right? There it is. There's the RS number. It's important to know if you have that mutation. That means your, your SIRT1 may not be as effective. By the way, resveratrol can help with that. Now, if you remember, we did a, uh, I should have put this on. We did a whole video on IL-6. If you yes. Yes. So if you just uh, search uh, Dr. Jill Carnahan, Bob Miller, IL-6, I think we geeked out for about an hour and 45 minutes on IL-6. Yeah. Uh, and NOx stimulates IL-6. And the reason for the interest in that, that's what created the, the cytokine storm in, uh, in COVID. Interestingly, pine bark can calm this down. Black Cuban seed oil can calm this down. Now, the other thing that'll calm this down is Billy Verdon and Billy Rubin. And I think one of the most fun uh, podcasts we did when we talked about why, high, why heme oxygenase enzyme is critical. We, we geeked out for quite a while on the heme cycle, heme oxygenase, and how it makes Billy Verdon and Billy Rubin to calm this down. So I know some of you are probably thinking, I see a perfect storm occurring here. You're exposed to mycotoxins. Your TNFA is overactive. Maybe your CERT1 is underactive. Maybe your heme oxygenase isn't doing what it should. Maybe this isn't doing what it should. That is the prescription for massive overreaction to stimuli. So that's why two people can live in the same home. Mm -hmm. That's a little moldy. And the one person is sick as can be. And the other one says, what mold? You yeah. must be imagining things. Because <laughs> I don't feel anything. And it really creates uh, quite the dilemma for some people when the least little bit of stimulation puts them into a massive inflammation and the other person says, Hi, what, what, what's wrong? I don't notice anything. Yes. So when that happens, usually there's it's invariable. TNFA is upregulated. By the way, excess iron can stimulate this. I didn't put the iron genes in here, but uh, that can do it as well. Weakness here. Uh, well, well, I don't think we'll talk about NERF2 and uh and keep one today, but uh, they also impact this. And then if we have problems in the heme cycle. So it's usually, you know, that person who is just sick as could be with mold uh, or Lyme, you know, they uh, they usually have some weakness somewhere where this is upregulated. CERT1 heme oxygenase is downregulated. Now, additionally, histamine will stimulate this. So to learn all about histamine, go listen to our number 34, histamine tolerance. Electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. will also stimulate NOx. There we are on number 54. And then, as I said, uh, really encourage you to listen to the heme oxygenase, uh, number 119. Uh, you know, Dr. Joe, we really have a cool library of stuff that's uh, covering a lot of bases here. I know. It's been so fun to continue. And, and like I said at the beginning, we have so many practitioners that appreciate this. And if you're a layperson listening, this may be just slightly over your head, but I think 
there's so many practical applications. Absolutely. We're going to get to the practical applications in a little bit. By the way, hops, yep, same thing that's in beer, uh, calms down hemoxygenase. Broncoraffin, you may have heard of that. That's the uh, that's the, the broccoli that uh, yeah. supports the uh, the nerve too. too. Yep. Now, just briefly, we're going to talk about iron sulfur clusters. And you know what? In the future, I may come to you and say, Dr. Jill, let's let's do a show on iron sulfur yes. clusters <laughs> because they're they're fascinating. So we are not even putting our toe in the water here. They're essential cofactors known for their role mediating electron transfer within the mitochondria respiratory chain. That's what we spoke about mm -hmm. earlier, electron transport chain. It plays a critical role in transporting electrons through those complexes, one, two, and three, to cytochrome C before subsequent transfer to molecular oxygen. Folks, this is where you make your energy. This is where you make your ATP. And this is what greases the wheels, so to speak, for you, makes it happen. Now, this is a chart that I just made. And up at the top here, you'll see complex one, two, three, four, five. Here's your ATP energy. And here is four irons, four sulfurs in an iron sulfur cluster. Now, there's an enzyme called NFU1 that makes this. And Dr. Jill, when we look at your uh, genome, you're going to see we got a little bit of trouble there. So hang on, everybody, to watch for this. Now, also, we need iron. And the enzyme FXN puts the iron into this pathway. And then here comes sulfur. And we're going to show you, you can have mutations on FXN. And we're, you know, relatively new into this, but what we're finding is when people have mutations on this F FXN, they're tired and inflamed mm -hmm. because they're not getting the iron up here and the iron might be uh, going off to be a bad boy. Uh. Now, also we mentioned earlier, the superoxide can steal some of this iron and go over here and make hydroxyl radicals. So I didn't know this until we really started digging into the, to the literature. So what you need to grease your wheels here, so to speak, to help these electrons move along can be harmed by superoxide. But look what happens if we don't have this electron transfer going on. The electron combines with oxygen to make superoxide. Wow. Ouch. Ouch. So another three ring circus here, Dr. Joe. Now we need sulfur to be part of that as well. And there's an enzyme called NSF1 that gets its sulfur from cysteine. So many people have heard of cysteine, and acetyl cysteine. Mm -hmm. It's part of the heme cycle. It forms pyruvate and taurine. For anybody who's looked at uh, at methylation, homocysteine comes down here, turns into cysteine. Cysteine is all one of the also one of the tripeptides that makes glutathione, along with glutamate and, and glycine, the master antioxidant. We're in the early early stages of this, and I debated whether to put it in because we're still we're still early. But I thought, well, I just for the practitioners, just introduce them to this concept because it might be something we're going to talk about later. So I'm going to jump here to nitric oxide, which again, everything you've heard about it that's good is absolutely correct. Through the CGMP, this is what lowers your blood pressure by regulating vascular tone, inhibits platelet aggregation, all those good things that nitric oxide does. But as we also said, nitric oxide will combine with superoxide to make peroxynitrite. And here's probably a new term to a lot of people, aberrant nitric mm -hmm. oxide. You've heard of that? Well, I have not heard of that term, but just clinically, kind of from our previous discussions, I had a big aha because I always was so puzzled as to why all the precursors of nitric oxide, like arginine or citrulline or even beets, would cause me to fall flat on my face with exhaustion. And we talked about that in our previous episode. So go back and watch those. But I remember when we first talked about it, having such an aha, because it's wonderful. We need it. But if you have the, it's the uh, the second pathway, right? The INOS that's upregulated? Yes. Mm -hmm. The NOS. Yes, NOS. two, two, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Now, what aberrant nitric oxide is, we're going to talk about this a little bit. It causes something called nitrosylation. Ah. And one of the things it'll damage is cysteine. Mm. Ouch. Wow. Now, we were frantically trying to find literature that would support that this nitrosylation of cysteine would impact the sulfur delivery. You'd almost think it would, it would, but we don't have proof for it yet. Interesting. So hang on, because what it does then, it makes S-nitrosylated cysteine. Then that turns into S-nitroglutathione, and there's an enzyme called ADH5 that turns it into N-hydrosulfonamide, and then that turns into oxidized glutathione and can be recycled. And then also something called thriodoxin will repair it. So we've got two repair mechanisms. One is thriodoxin, and one is through this ADH5. Now, you've probably already jumped ahead of me and said, you know, what happens if you got mutations here and here? These people are not doing well. Yes. So. Well, and I have a, a subset of patients who do not do well on NAC. And this is back to one of the, I think the foundational principles that you and I talk about frequently is all of these nutrients and supplements and cofactors and things can be so important in the right person, right? Like there are people who don't do well with glutathione because they oxidize it or they don't do well with NAC or even sulfur, which I'm sure you're going to go into. But my clinical thought is I have a lot of people who really, really need sulfur and yet they're very reactive to sulfur and sulfur is kind of like a um, yin and yang for those patients that need it, but they don't do well with too much sulfur. Yes, absolutely. So stay tuned. We're going to be um, trying to find, I was hoping to find it for this, for this recording. I was and my whole research team saying it's got to be out there, but nobody can seem to find it yet. My suspicion would be it would almost have to. Yeah. But maybe not. And we're also looking, is there other sources of sulfur? Mm -hmm. And um, that's undetermined yet. Uh, I mean, yes, there's plenty of sources for sulfur, but we're talking about the sulfur that comes up here. We don't know yet. That's under, under research. But clearly, uh, if someone has... And I'm going to show a mutation here and how that can affect someone. But if you've got too much of this going on, and now I'm going to back up another step because we'll get into this later. There's something called the NMDA receptor that when it's stimulated by glyphosate, arsenic, phthalate, CMF, or homocysteine, it brings excess calcium into the cell, excess intracellular calcium, by the way, which has been proven to be happening in autistic kids stimulating the NOS1 enzyme, then overproducing the nitric oxide that becomes the aberrant nitric oxide. Now, we're also, when we when we look at your genome, you'll see here, we're looking at the uh, all the things that make, make the CGMP, and we're trying to find out, is there ways to encourage the nitric oxide to go here? Don't know yet. Okay. But clearly when NOS1 is upregulated, we make this aberrant nitric oxide, which then makes more peroxynitrite. And you saw the circus that that. Yes. Creates. So superoxide promotes hydroxyl radical formation and consequent DNA damage in cells of all types. And superoxide may accelerate DNA damage, listen to this, by leaching iron from that four iron, four sulfur cluster. So this is what helps us make energy and superoxide takes it away. Mm. Another three ring circus here, Jill. Now, superoxide and hydrogen peroxide oxidize this iron sulfur into an unstable iron sulfur intermediate, which is degraded to three iron four sulfur. And what does this do, Dr. Jill? Releases free iron and then activates the enzyme. Then here comes Mr. Fenton making more hydroxyl radicals. And then those hydroxyl radicals we react with all the macromolecules, including proteins, lipids, or DNA. And you can just see how there's multiple rings of inflammation going on here, Dr. Jill. Yes. Superoxide inhibits the uh, iron sulfur cluster enzymes involved in amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, amazing how this thing just uh, keeps doing damage 
everywhere it goes. Now, I just wanted to illustrate, and again, we're uh, we're not going to talk about this a lot because we're in the early stages, but here's that uh, NMDA enzyme when it gets stimulated, extra calcium stimulates the NNOS. Here's your nitric oxide. INOS stimulates it. Superoxide peroxynitrite, the good guy over here. Organic nitrates increase that, inhibit the platelet aggregation. And then here's where your cysteine becomes nitrosylated. Interestingly, you know, we've had this discussion many times. A little bit of something can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Too much of it can be harmful. So in small amounts, it can be neuroprotective. And then it can be attempting to protect brain cells. But in too much, it's neurodestructive. So a lot to learn here. We're just in the early stages. So just a definition, S-nitrosylation regulates protein function via reaction of nitric oxide-related species with a cysteine thiol group on the target protein. So with aging or environmental toxins that generate excessive nitric oxide, aberrant S-nitrosylation reactions can occur and affect protein misfolding, mitochondrial fragmentation, synaptic function, apoptosis, or even impact that important autophagy. I'm not going to read these, just highlight a few. Aberrant S nitrosylation, decreased antioxidant activity, cell death, neuroinflammation, impaired metabolism, signal transduction, uh, cell death, and in inhibition of autophagy. Those are all the things that can happen if we have aberrant nitrosylation. And again, just showing that same slide again to, uh, to summarize it, when we get these environmental toxins, we have our aberrant nitric oxide, impacts our cysteine, now whether or not it affects this or not, but it would have to affect your, uh, your glutathione. You could have mutations here that you don't get your sulfur up. You can have mutations here that the iron doesn't come over. And you can have mutations here that you don't make that iron sulfur cluster. And then your superoxide. So even if you do get here, okay, superoxide can come along and undo it. So no wonder so many people are fatigued. Now, this comes from a, an 18-year-old boy, rather a severe autism. And he's got this NFS1. And you can see this mutation occurs in 0.5% of the population. Now, in my 80,000 samples in my software, there's no homozygous, none. I would imagine life couldn't exist if this was homozygous. Yeah. Wow. So this is where the cysteine comes up here, turns into alanine, and brings that sulfur up through. This is the FXN gene. This is the one that we talked about that um, brings your iron in. So you can see FXN coming in, combining with the sulfur to make your sulfur cluster. This protein functions in regulating mitochondrial iron transport. And look at this little chart here. When this guy's mutated, Rather than making the oxphos, which is needed for the electron transport chain, there's iron accumulation inside the cell with mitochondrial impairment. In other words, they're going to be inflamed and tired. This comes from a 20-some-year-old uh, gentleman, so embarrassed that he can't hardly work because he's so tired, and he was so relieved to see, oh, that's why. Yes, <laughs> so, an aha, huh? <laughs> yes. All right, and here's the NFU1. This is what puts it together. And this puts together a protein that's localized and plays a critical role in the iron sulfur cluster biogenesis. Again, this comes from a rather severe um, autistic child. So homozygous two, 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 meaning that that last step can't be made. You're not gonna have the iron sulfur cluster. The electrons are not going to flow smoothly they're going to fly off and make superoxide. Now, this is just a um, the, the NMDA receptor, and I encourage people to go back to our, I think this was our most recent one, 162, yes. the lesser known cause of mast cell activation, where we talked about how glyphosate, arsenic, homocysteine, high fructose corn syrup, electromagnetic fields, phthalates, which comes from all of our plastics, and what a disaster we have with uh, mm -hmm. microplastics. We have... Uh, Oh, yeah. really messed up big time. 
So all of those will bring extra calcium in, and as we discussed, stimulates the INOS, the nitric oxide, creates the peroxynitrite, but the NOx5 enzyme directly makes superoxide. So here's another way to make yet more superoxide. So there's the uh, 90 second, if you want the uh, hour and a half version, uh, listen to number uh, 162. So here's just a real quick slide that shows that homocysteine um, induces cell death by the activation of that NMDA receptor. And by the way, that's what, uh, that's what creates your osteopenia and osteoporosis. Fructose ingestion, you know, that fruit, high fructose corn syrup came about, it was only invented in 1977. Again, historically not very long. Yeah. And, um, what a disaster, uh, because it increases the activation of the NMDA receptor function. So can you imagine some poor kid who's sitting for breakfast and he's having a, he's having a cereal with that in it, maybe some milk with, uh, with uh, growth hormones in it, Maybe the cereal has glyphosate on it and they're playing on their iPad and we're wondering why they can't pay attention in school. Yes, it's a such a toxic storm. What I really enjoy about our conversations is my biggest platform is the environmental toxic load and what it does to our body and how it really is the elephant in the room. And so often, even as we study these genetic mutations and SNPs, it comes back to so many of the environmental inputs that are causing it to escalate to a level of clinical significance. Absolutely. That's why, as we said, one person can be affected yes. and the other one person says, I don't feel a thing. Mm -hmm. Phthalates. Oh my goodness. What, what a mess we've done. That's what you get from your uh, microplastics. And I think it was um, January of this year, a study came out that showed that the microplastics in our water bottles is 10 to 100 times more than previously anticipated. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. So it comes from ingestion, inhalation, dermal absorption. I've heard some estimates that we each get a, uh, a credit card a week in plastics. Yeah, this, I was going to mention that because that makes it so practical for people to think about. That's a lot of plastic um, it, that we ingest. And this has been found in uh, atherosclerotic plaques and all over our bodies and our blood vessels. And it's creating not only damage, but inflammation. Absolutely. And you can even get dermal absorption wow. from personal care products. Ah. So uh, I, I always encourage people to uh, look at everything. And if it says fragrance, uh, find mm -hmm. something that, that doesn't. And even people who live near phthalate manufacturing are more likely to have phthalates into their body through that dermal absorption. Research shows that because of phthalate's structural similarity to tryptophan metabolites, they're capable of inhibiting two really important enzymes. Now, I've often said, if somebody wanted to figure out how they could hurt humanity the most, I don't know that you could be this creative to come up with something that, that, this, uh, that this does. Because what happens is tryptophan comes down through here and has to be turned into picolinic acid, which is needed to help your zinc and your chromium do their job. Zinc inhibits the NMDA receptor. So if this substance right here that I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce doesn't come over this way, it'll make more what's called quinolinic acid. And quinolinic acid is very inflammatory to the brain. And quinolinic acid will stimulate the NMDA receptor and phthalates inhibit that as well. Wow. So you can see how phthalates are the proverbial perfect storm. And then, as you can imagine, you can also have genetic mutations in ACMS. And you can also have genetic mutations in clearing phthalates. So if you don't clear phthalates, you microwave in plastic or you drink out of plastic bottles and you use a lot of personal care products and you have mutations here, um, no wonder you can't focus and your brain's on fire because this quinolinic acid is stimulating the NMDA receptor. So as I said, I don't think if you wanted to, you could come up with something that creative to be harmful. Now, the story gets even a little bit bigger. When this NMDA receptor gets upregulated, it also stimulates glutamate. Now, glutamate makes you intelligent, highly motivated, go-getter but it can also make you 
very anxious and can make it difficult to sleep. And at, and at the worst, it can actually even create some uh, psychological problems for you as you uh, as the glutamate goes up. So you've got this dance between the two of them. And you mentioned earlier about having difficulty with uh, cysteine. Well, glutamate inhibits the enzyme that allows cysteine to come in to make the glutathione that's needed to deal with that ferroptosis that we spoke about earlier. So again, another three-ring circus here, Dr. Jill. Now, we spoke earlier, I'm glad you brought that up, that glutathione, master antioxidant. As it goes down, you're not going to do well, and it takes out all the toxins. So one would think that, well, let's just take glutathione, and you're going to do well. So some people do fabulous on it, some don't. Now, what happens is when glutathione does its job, it becomes oxidized, and we need an enzyme called GSR, NADPH, something called FAD that comes from riboflavin. And you can have genetic mutations on riboflavin. You can have genetic issues on GSR. Here, you'll see one right here. There's a, mm -hmm. this SNP right here is a pathological down regulation. So if you've got difficulty recycling, and you take too much glutathione, thinking you're doing yourself good. Yes. Well, look who's down here. Superoxide. Yeah, Bob, we've talked about this before since we've done so many episodes and talked about me, but that was me, especially right after the mold, maybe uh, 10 years ago, where I could not take glutathione. I did not do well. And I know I had some of these genetic mutations. And I just want to pause here, whether you're a cl clinician or patient, one of the important principles here is it, there's no one size fits all. And I can't emphasize that enough because I hear patients all the time. Well, I should be able to, or I'm supposed to, or this is good for me. And the truth is that everybody is so individualized. And I always have to say, you know what, maybe glutathione is not good for you, or maybe excess NAC is not good for you. And patients think because they've read about the power of this or read about the importance of this antioxidant. And sadly, manufacturers, supplement companies, influencers are making this even worse because they're out there promoting this one product is good for everybody. And I just, I wanted to pause here and say, that's just not true. And one of the reasons I do these individualized cases and that you do the same because it's so different for everyone and there is no one size fits all. And just because a nutrient is supposed to be good, it might be toxic to you if you have the wrong genetics. Dr. Jill, that was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> uh, you ought to maybe put that on one of your uh, your Facebook things Oops. as a little, little <laughs> clip to, uh, to put that out there. So uh, brilliantly, brilliantly said. Um, one of the ways I put it is if somebody tells you everyone should yes. be very concerned. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Or here's the protocol for fill in the blank. It's like, right. well, maybe. Uh -huh. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. What the world is that? So, chemicals consisting of numerous carbon atoms joined together to form multiple rings. There's 10,000 different PAH, uh, PAH compounds. So it's from the incomplete combustion of plant or animal matter, carbon fuels, such as coal or petroleum. Uh, they're the sooty part of smoke or ash, as we spoke about earlier, from forest fires, industrial processes, automobile exhaust, industrial emissions, and smoke from burning wood, charcoal, and tobacco contain high levels of pH. Grilled smoke and charbroiled foods, especially meats, are a source of some pH exposure. I'm sure you've run into this. Somebody just goes to a, a backyard barbecue, and uh, and they're sick from the barbecue. Have you heard of that? Oh, I have had multiple cases of very specifically exposed to this exhaust or smoke or uh, charbroiled or a, a, a restaurant where they have a, a grill or this is actually quite common. And patients are kind of confused because like going out with the campfire is supposed to be this fun, wonderful family activity or going to a, a charbroiled restaurant where they grill in front of you. These are like kind of things that people look forward to. And for some people, it literally takes them out of commission for days at a time. Absolutely. Well, here's why. There's something called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Now, what is that? Okay, now normally enzymes take one substance, combine with something else, and make something new. No, this is a completely different animal here, Dr. Jill. If smoke, kynerenine from the uh, kynerenine pathway, mold, high homocysteine, high iron, 
arachidonic acid, those hydrocarbons, let our mercury go in, it actually stimulates that intracellular calcium that we spoke about that makes superoxide, stimulates ferroptosis, makes these inflammatory genes upregulated, reactive oxygen species, DNA damage. Then it stimulates uh, interleukin-6 and NOx to make superoxide. And one of the cytochromes, CP, well, that should be CPY mm -hmm. there, that makes quinones and uh, semi-quinones that make superoxide. So again, we're making superoxide. On the other hand, B12, folate, rosemary, resveratrol, physitin, quercetin, milk thistle, indole-3-carbonyl, narragenin, and luteolin turn on the NERF-2 side. Now, one of the most interesting clients I ever saw was a woman who said, Bob, you're not going to believe me. I have to take 150 milk thistles a day to survive. Wow. And it's like, seriously? <laughs> yeah. So she'd have to take five to eight. It would last an hour and a half. And then the pain would be back again. So what she was doing, she was so happy to see that, you know, she wasn't crazy. She was having to stimulate this anti-inflammatory side. Last time we spoke, we had her down to 12 a day. Wow. Yeah, because we did some of the things over here, started working on the aromatic hydrocarbons, arachidonic acid. You know, some people even need a uh, an air purifier in their car. I don't know if you can do that or not, but you can actually get little things that sit in your uh, in your coffee cup, run off the cigarette lighter, and clean the air in the car. And these people need very good air purification. Bob, so, I have one of those. I have a really expensive, it's not a small thing. It's about as big as, uh, larger than my head. And it goes up behind the passenger seat. Oh, really? Yeah, it's from a company called IQ Air. And I thought, of course, I love to experiment. So I'm like, I'm going to get one of these and try it. Now, I happen to not have horrible, horrible issues with exhaust and definitely molds and those kinds of things. But I was like, let's check this out. So there are some pretty fancy devices you can get. Um, like that. And again, there's many others. I have no uh, association with the company, but that's just one of those. Um, and for those people who are really, really sensitive or who will drive like say LA traffic, or maybe they just, um, and you might notice this by saying, again, LA traffic's a perfect example. Maybe, maybe you have a two hour commute to work or an hour and a half and you get so, so exhausted that by the time I've had patients that say, you know, I'm in my car for my commute and I get home and I have to take a nap. I just don't feel well, or they have a headache. Absolutely. That comes from that. And I've seen this with truck drivers and also people who do uh, outside landscaping work where they're constantly using machines that are giving off uh, smoke. So let's go back to our phthalates here now. Those phthalates will inhibit the QPRT enzyme that makes NAD that holds back the mast cells. Wow. So you can see how this is like the proverbial perfect storm. And these, why, these are the people, they just get a little bit of smoke and they're sick. Um, they walk into a moldy house, they're sick. Um, anything that can happen that can just be the slightest irritating, even some perfumes will do yes. this for some individuals. This likely isn't the only reason why people are like that, but this could be, you know, a reason why some people are, are struggling. Now, there's an enzyme called NQO1, and this also reduces uh, superoxide. And um, suggests that superoxide reductase activity does have cellular relevance. It's not a big one, but it does reduce uh, superoxide in cardiovascular cells. Now, here's what happens again, back to the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. They will stimulate uh, these CYPs, and they'll make something called quinones. And then that'll turn into a semi-quinone. And then look what happens here, Dr. Jill. Mm. Oxygen, superoxide destroy your nitric oxide, stimulate ferroptosis, lipid peroxides. Wow. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, this NQO1 enzyme, and by the way, here's the RS numbers. You really shouldn't know if you have those or not. Take NADPH and hydrogen back to your breathing hydrogen, drinking hydrogen, yes. turns that quinone back into oxygen. So that's why this NQO1 is, uh, is so important. It's controlled by NERF2 and also controlled by HEAP1. So that's probably why you really enjoy your, your I believe you're still breathing. Oh, hydrogen right therapy. here beside me. <laughs> I use it all the time. Uh, yes. So the, um, and then there's are multiple SNPs in the CYP1A1 that can be gain of function. So in addition to being exposed to that, 
you can actually have gain of function. By the way, selenium and vitamin E can calm this guy down a little bit in addition to those um, to those other things. So drinking your hydrogen, breathing your hydrogen, more importantly, staying away from that air pollution as much as you can. All right, now we made a case as to how we can make it all. How do we break it down? So we're going to talk about manganese, SOD2, B12, and PON1. So we spoke about manganese earlier, and this is just a little easier to see. So here's your superoxide. Manganese grabs that electron. It's now got a spare electron here. Turns your superoxide into oxygen. It's got a spare electron here. Here's two hydrogens that we just spoke about. Takes the superoxide, turns it into hydrogen peroxide. That's manganese SOD or SOD2. Now, we spoke about this at the very beginning. Glyphosate reduced seed and leaf concentrations of calcium, manganese, magnesium, and iron in soybeans. So they're finding that glyphosate yeah. Yeah. is reducing our manganese. So in case anybody doesn't know it, that's, that's Roundup. And the way it works, you put it on the weeds and it kills them. Well, it does that by just chelating their minerals. So they're essentially starving. So... Somebody should have thought about this, that yeah. if it does it to the plant, what happens when we when we then eat the plant as well? And I know uh, Stephanie Seneff does a lot of work on this, and uh, she talks about how glyphosate may be impacting our, our manganese. And manganese is one of those minerals we don't talk about a lot, uh, but uh, we really need to be looking at our, our manganese. And here's a chart. There's a delicate balance. So... What no one should do is, based on what we said here today, start taking lots of anything, yes. including manganese, because it can become toxic. Above uh, 15 milligrams, it can actually become toxic, and anything less than 1.8 can be low. So it is important that we have the right amount of, of, of manganese, because low impaired growth, abnormal glucose tolerance, um, in here, you've got all the things going right. But then over here, you can have oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction if you take too much. So just word to the wise, don't think I'm going to be really super here and take lots of manganese and I'll be much better. You can actually be worse. So. You know, Bob, I love that you mentioned that because a lot of minerals, selenium can have a biphasic curve and many of these other minerals um, that are trace minerals absolutely have this like Goldilocks perfect balance. So I am a huge fan of actually measuring, or if we don't know and we suspect issues, sometimes the trace minerals or the fulvic acids or things that have just a little bit in a very, very um, neutral source is a, a way to go because you're not get, ever getting excessive amounts of one thing. Absolutely. Glad you brought that up. Is that so important that we don't get uh, too much or too little? Um, I've heard that uh, 50 micrograms is about the sweet spot for uh, for selenium. Have you heard the same thing? Or is... Yes. Yes. We, a lot of people are taking 200 or 400 or much more. And I'm very cautious. And I would say mm. as I check levels in the blood, which is easy to do on a quest or a lab core, and I check RBC magnesium, if you're a practitioner ordering these tests, and I see a decent amount that are high, that are almost toxic. I would say maybe 30% of the people we test that are taking what they think is a normal dose are too high in selenium. Yeah. I always try to keep it at uh, 50 micrograms. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a fun little chart. Okay. So, so. For you and me, maybe, right, Bob? <laughs> I love it. So we thought, why don't we draw how SOD2 works? Yeah. And, I, and I wish uh, Erwin Fredovich was here to see this. Okay. So here's SOD2, manganese SOD. And there's two uh, SNPs. Uh, there's the RS numbers. Then when you got mutations on those, the gene itself or the enzyme itself isn't as strong as it should be. So here's manganese and here's superoxide. So superoxide turns into oxygen this way. Then we take the superoxide and two hydrogens, turn it into hydrogen peroxide. However, there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. Again, peroxynitrite. Okay. Peroxynitrite will do what's called nitration of tyrosine. And that can shut this down by almost 97%. Ouch. Wow. Cert one, sirtuins. 
there's a mutation here. This one's the strongest one. CERT1 helps SOD2 do its job. F12 will help it do its job, but there's mutations on there will inhibit it. Now, there's also uh, an amino acid called lysine. It's an amino acid. And interestingly, it normally has a positive charge. And what it'll do, it will bring that negative electron in and say, hey, Mr. Electron, come on inside here. I want to introduce you to Mr. Manganese, who's just going to help you out here a little bit. However, there's something called acetylation from acetyl-CoA that will take that negative charge off. CERT3, CERT2 and number 3, deacetylates lysine. Now, if you had a little trouble following that, I get it, but that's, that's a lot of steps there. So lysine has a positive charge. This puts it back to negative. This puts it back to positive. And it's driven by NAD. And there's a whole bunch of genetic things that can go on here that makes not have enough NAD. And then there's an, a, 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 an interleukin called interleukin 13 that the mutations can inhibit this. The, uh, the cysteine, this is what we talked about earlier, that the, the cysteine can be impaired by the uh, nitrosylation. And then manganese can be impaired by glyphosate. There's what are called solute carriers that, uh, that carry it in. So you can see here, there's a lot that can go wrong that this guy's not working at 100%. And that's what we're doing now with our, with our software, trying to figure out are they making too much peroxynitrite? Is there mutations on CERT1 or F12? Is CERT3 weak? And what you generally find is when someone makes more superoxide and they're impaired, they're in trouble. Mm. They just can't seem to mm -hmm. find out that. what to do. Now, here is just a, an example here of this nitration of tyrosine from peroxynitrite. So here's... Um, Here's that, oh no, that's your peroxynitrite. It's called nitration. And it nitrates one of the tyrosine residues that can shut down that manganese SOD considerably. We need CERT3 to help deacetylate that, uh, that tyrosine. So that's why the CERT3 is so important on helping that out. But also we have to slow down the peroxynitrite production. All right, and here's the F12. Probably not many people haven't heard of F12. Um, our, uh, our genetic researcher found this one. Yeah. This SNP has been strongly associated with altered SOD concentrations. Specifically, the A allele was, was associated with decreased mitochondrial SOD concentrations during a study of European ancestry. And the, um, the G allele was strongly associated with increased SOD concentration. And here you can see this individual, both parents gave a mutation, 8.7% of the population. Now, one of these probably doesn't matter, but when they pile up on you, that's when it becomes a problem. Okay, here I, you know, I talked about the CERT3. So clinical studies have shown that CERT3 expression declines by 40% by age 65. I hate when that happens. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Paralleling the increased incidence of hypertension and metabolic conditions that further inactivate CERT3 to do to increased acetyl-CoA levels. And that's one of the areas we want to look uh -huh. at. Is there environmental or genetic factors that could create increased acetyl-CoA? Don't know yet. Uh, but CERT3 impairment reduces the activity of superoxide dismutase 2 due to hyperacetylation Interestingly, magnolia bark, milk thistle, NAD, and bakelin or skull cap support CERT3. So this is the genome of a little girl who's very autistic. Don't not saying this is the cause, mm -hmm. could be a contributing factor. Yeah. You can see that um, got it from both parents, only occurs in 4.9% of the population. And you can see a little bit better. Yeah. Acetyl CoA comes down here, takes that positive charge off, doesn't allow the electron to come in. CERT3 comes to the rescue, but you can have this uh, this one here that ends in 20 that's a pathological downregulation. So, uh, so we've got to also figure out not only uh, 
how do we support CERT three? But how do we slow down acetylation? We don't know yet. No, that's that's an area of uh, of research. Now, I believe uh, you just had uh, Dr. Christy Sutton on recently talking about iron. Yes, Deli delightful young lady, by the way, and uh, she she really knows uh, her stuff on iron. And and what can happen is that we need that manganese in there to do the job. And if we're manganese sufficient, we're going to have that antioxidant capacity. But if we're manganese deficient and iron enriched, the um, the iron goes into sod two instead and actually becomes pro-oxidant. Yeah. This, so, Bob, I just so, want to pause there really quick. We've talked about this in almost every session because the iron is such a uh, yin and yang. We need it. We need it to make energy. But once again, just like excessive calcium, excessive manganese, excessive selenium, for the wrong person, iron can be incredibly, I always tell them it's like a car that's getting rusted. That's your iron getting oxidized. And if you have too much in the wrong location, like intracellularly without the right cofactors, um, again, we went. We could do another two hours on this, but I just want to emphasize for those of you listening that um, a lot of the old medical school training was give all women iron or this or that, and it's just not a one size fits all. So if you're taking iron, you better be sure that you need it and you're not creating rust on the inside, which is a, a metaphor for oxidative stress. Absolutely. Uh, don't remember where I heard this, but unless you have bleeding or some other problem, one chicken leg a week may give you all the iron that you really need. I couldn't agree more. So clinically, I do not give a lot of people iron unless I'm certain that they're anemic or need it. Absolutely. But even with anemia, if the uh, Fenton reaction is yes. going on, it can be that the iron is just creating oxidative stress and not building the red blood cells. So it's really, uh, really tricky. So this is the same chart, but you'll notice iron is in here mm -hmm. rather than manganese. So guess what happens to your superoxide? Nothing. It just uh, sits there and wrecks havoc, and you've already learned now what that does. All right, B12. Interestingly, I uh, I wasn't aware of this until we started digging into it. I mean, we all know the benefits of B12, but B12 will take superoxide and turn it into hydrogen peroxide. And there's a lot that can go wrong. So here's your sources of B. Oops, here's your sources of uh, of B12 over here. There's an enzyme called TCN1 that gets it into the body. Then intrinsic factor gets it into the blood. And sometimes when you have mutations here, particularly on this TCN2, blood levels are high, but tissue levels are low. Oh, yes. So, Bob, I want to talk about this because I talk about this all the time. And now that I have a PA nurse practitioner in the clinic, I was teaching them recently. So many doctors get a B12 level for their patient. That's lovely. It's a serum B12 that's on Quest, LabCorp, any hospital lab. And so many times, as soon as we start supplementing, that serum level will go greater than 1,000. So it's very, very high. The reaction I most frequently see from other practitioners telling my patients, oh, stop the B12. It's really, really high in the serum. And my thought is, yes, in some patients, it's too much, but most of the patients are not getting it intracellularly for one of these reasons. And they actually are, that sometimes can be a sign of them needing more or needing a transport. I think we talked one time about lithium as a cofactor, which can open yes. the doors. A very simplified version can open the doors. And there's other factors here. But I love that you're mentioning that because those people listening who don't know or who've been told by their doctor, or maybe you're a physician out there who's telling people to stop B12, you really need to know what's going on because high serum level could actually mean even more of an intracellular gradient. Absolutely brilliant. Yes. And that's why we formulated a product of uh, the three B12s, lithium and folic yes. acid. Brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Drive it, it in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The um, nitric oxide and uh, peroxidase. PON1 in plasma decisively flavors the activity of ENOS and therefore the production of nitric oxide, vasodilators, and platelet aggregates. So you need to look at your PON1 enzyme as well. All right. We're going to take some practical lifestyle steps. Then, Dr. Jill, we're going to take a peek at you and see what uh, see what's going on with your iron sulfur clusters. So, obvious, avoid mold, remediate if exposed. Um, I'm sure you have a couple comments on that. 
Yeah, I just, uh, gosh, if you guys haven't got my free mold guide, you can download it. Um, I'll be sure and put the link in the show notes, but the basics there are um, you cannot get well if you are sensitive and in a moldy environment. So that is a great step one. And then clean air, consider uh, purifiers. In my office, I have three of them. I have an IQ air, a molecule, and a Dyson. Yeah. Um, because we have to really keep the air clean. Organic food as much as possible. I know some people uh, have trouble with the cost, but as much as possible, organic food. And avoid microplastics and fragrance as much as possible. You know, when you get those water bottles that are flimsy plastic, and during the summer, can you imagine if they're in a tractor trailer and it gets 120 degrees or higher in there, what that plastic must be doing? It just must be pouring right in. Yeah. All right. Potential nutrient support. Uh, pine bark or pycnogenol may reduce peroxynitrite. Black cumin seed oil may slow TNFA if overactive. Hops can support the hemox function. Catalase and glutathione reduce the hydrogen peroxide. Sod, now I want to talk about this. Somebody might be watching this and they'll say, well, it sounds like I need SOD. So they'll go on the internet and they'll buy some SOD. And they'll feel good for a day or two. And then it's like, what the heck just happened to me? Okay. The reason you got to be careful is because it sounds backwards, but it works. Well, what it does, it makes hydrogen peroxide. And if you don't have enough catalase or glutathione to reduce it, SOD is going to make you worse. So what I do clinically sometimes is I'll give people catalase and glutathione for 10 days and then say, take one SOD tablet one day a week. And that works. But if you just pour in SOD, it can backfire on you terribly. And I know there's some companies out there that make just SOD only. And um, it probably works for some people, but it can backfire quickly. Nitrates may support healthy nitric oxide production. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because I know that's an area that you really speak about quite a bit. Yeah, once again, if you're super inflamed or someone like me with these mutations, um, you have to be careful with that as well. Um, but many people do benefit. I always say food is usually a great source. So you almost can't go wrong by eating your leafy greens. And that's a great way to start if you're concerned about um, issues. Mm -hmm. Lycopene and riboflavin may help recycle glutathione. This is the list selenium, vitamin E, rosemary, physetin, luteolin, quercetin, narogenin, indole 3 carbonyl, tart cherry juice. They may slow down that arrow hydrocarbon receptor. Uh, taurine, magnesium, zinc, and cat's claw may slow the NMDA receptor. IP6, that's a form of inositol, may reduce inflammation from intracellular iron. And um, manganese at the right dose, not too much, can support your uh, your SOD. All right, this, we'll look at this, then we'll go to, uh, to your genome. Have your health professional check your homocysteine. Keep it in normal range. Work with health professionals to check for mycotoxins or glyphosate. Uh, monitor iron levels and take needed steps to balance. Check B12 and keep in normal range. Or as Dr. Jill just very brilliantly said, sometimes it needs a little higher. Um, check for um, mycotoxins or glyphosate. And I realized I just said that twice. Measure your fun functional genomics to see where there may be genomic weakness and apply targeted nutritional support. So before we go to look at uh, Dr. Jill, just want to mention that for the practitioners, um, we have our own genetic test called functional genomic analysis. We have our own uh, genetic uh, sample, and then we have uh, nutrition that works. So if you're a practitioner, please, not, not consumers, uh, you may want to check this out if you'd like to add this to your practice. We have an online certification course that... Uh, that teaches you. And um, if someone wants to contact our office, we've now, uh, I've gotten so busy, it's hard to take on new people, but I'm very fortunate. I brought on uh, Dr. Megan Ross. She's a naturopathic medical doctor who's doing consultations. And uh, there's our website phone number. And uh, there's the website for the, for the practitioners, Yvonne Lucchese is uh, support. So now let's look at you, Dr. Jill. So if you go back and watch our program on uh, on INOS, you'll see we went over that. So I'm going to like breeze through this very quickly, then get into the new stuff. So if you remember, Dr. Jill, you have the um, the mm -hmm. gene that you could overabsorb iron a little bit. Yeah, one copy so the, of chromatosis, main one, right? Yep. Then you have the uh, 
the the uh, the SLC forty A one ferroportin, they can bring a little more iron in. Fortunately, you don't have the upregulation of tumor necrosis factor. Your NF kappa B could be a little trigger happy. Your uh, another NF kappa B could be a little trigger happy. Fortunately, your CERT one is okay, but your uh, but your hemox is a little weak. And what's your saving grace here? I don't see this very often. Your nerf two is perfect, and your keep one is perfect. You don't see that very often at all. So, uh, so your hemox may not have held things back very well. Then, uh, then you may have a little bit of mast cells that are just a little trigger mm -hmm. happy. I do. <laughs> then your uh, then your your histamine, you uh, you may not make enough uh, DAO. You have a homozygous, meaning from both parents, on the enzyme that can make more histamine. And then you have the uh, the mm -hmm. MAOA and MAOB that can clear histamine. Now, on our show where we spoke about the, and we actually call it the Carnahan, if you look very carefully there, it says yes. <laughs> Carnahan reaction. I have it right there in the software. So you, you got that named after you, Dr. Jill. Um, Honored. <laughs> yeah. So you'll see here there's two mutations on NOS two that are considered gain of function and mom and dad gave you mutation. Mm -hmm. So this guy's trigger happy. The least little bit will cause them to go be a little more active. That can suppress the NOS3. Now, fortunately, you don't have a lot on NOS3, but that NOS2 is going to suppress it. So we don't know how much. I mean, genetics is a predisposition, not a, not a diagnosis, but good chance you're making a little bit of superoxide combining with the nitric oxide to make the peroxynitrite. Yes. You need uh, thriodoxin to uh, to clear the, um, the peroxynitrite. One little mutation there. The good news here is um, glutathione peroxidase one, keep one nerf two, perfect. Very rarely see it that good. So although we have some things that weren't so good, on the other hand, stellar right here. Don't see that very often. All right, then you're making the peroxynitrite. And here's that chart we just showed you, but now this is actually wow. in the software. Amazing. Yeah. So you can see here, there's that peroxynitrite possibly impacting the tyrosine. Mm -hmm. You are heterozygous on SOD2. So the SOD2 may not be as strong as it okay. should be. Quick question, Bob, no, to tyrosine in some patients, I more think about excessive production of norepinephrine, epinephrine, or neurotransmitters, so it can cause some anxiety in people. Um, is there any um, correlation here with tyrosine driving or depleting that, as, like, it, it could you clinically give too much tyrosine or too little to someone? Is that a factor here? Well, that's a, an excellent question, and I'll have to take that back to my, sure. to my research team, because what happens is the, um, the tyrosine, the, the residues get changed on it. Uh, now, does that mean that it's more susceptible or less susceptible to do that? That's got a, it. That's no question. Next, uh, next time we'll talk about that. <laughs> perfect. It sounds good. <laughs> All right. Uh, F12, you're perfect. Cert 1, you're perfect. Here's your lysine. You only have one little ding on one of them. You don't have the pathological one. Uh, so not, uh, not too bad there. Uh, your interleukin 13 just... One, so bottom line is your ability for a sod two is not perfect, but it's not bad. It's, it's, it's I want to just mention something you mentioned earlier. I think so important because this is back to people going online and trying to get some and maybe self medicate that SOD years and years ago. I'm sure when I was inflamed and depleted in glutathione, I took SOD and it did not go well. So I kind of want to emphasize that you said that because I think there's a lot of again, there's a lot of independent where people go out and try to fix themselves, which is wonderful. By all means, try to do things safely, but it often backfires. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that you mentioned that because I remember the day I took SOD and it wasn't very good. Yes, what what reaction did you have? Gosh, it's been like a long time ago. This was year, probably 20 years ago in the very beginning, maybe with Crohn's or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it was just either fatigue or more inflammation or pain. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly, but I haven't tried it since. Yeah, well, more than likely, it worked and made hydrogen peroxide. Yes, yes, that would make yeah. sense. Yeah. Now here's your uh, electron transport chain. And again, we spoke about in the beginning of the podcast, there's this electron transport chain. Uh -huh. 
where your electrons going to be bopping down through here and they make yeah. TP. However, we spoke earlier about that we need the sulfur iron complex and NFU1 puts it oh, together. Yes. And look what you got there. Oh, wow. Two, two. two. So, um, you know, we, we tell people when we find these things, we have solutions for it. We're working on this. We don't have it yet. This sure. is what we're working on right now. Um, my uh, Dr. Harold Landis says uh, he's going to be doing a webinar in uh, actually two weeks from today or, uh, or two weeks from Thursday. And we're going to be um, his assignment is let's learn about this guy and what to do about it. So we don't know what amino acids it's made from. Uh -huh. We don't know what breaks it down, what stimulates it. But in my mind, I see this guy as critical. Oh, boy, it makes so much sense. Now, Bob, I'm going to throw something out there. You may have the answer now or it may be our next webinar. But one thing I've been seeing with these, uh, first of all, long COVID, post COVID, Lyme, infections, toxins, all the things we've been talking about can affect the mitochondria for, for many of the reasons you've explained. But because of that, of course, mitochondria produces ATP, again, as you've explained so well, and is energy dependent. So many, many people at the root of their dysfunction have some sort of mitochondrial issue, which can come in many forms. But the research on methylene blue, I'm really curious to, to see what you've heard or, or how much you know about where that fits in because it's a it's a redox, like it, it decreases the oxidative stress in mitochondria, which is exactly what we're talking about. And I have seen it over and over again in some of these really tough cases, including in my myself, be a big uh, shifter of mm -hmm. energy and be a, a something that really kind of dampens that oxidative stress. Have you guys done any research on methylene blue or thought about that? Mm -hmm. In Not particularly, but it does seem to calm down some of that excess nitric oxide. So that might, we were wondering if that's part of it as well. That And again, it might be. That would make sense because that that's what I, I've been wondering too. I'm like, I think there's more to it than they, than they know. And as we, you and I kind of dive deeper, I think we'll find that would make sense if it dampened some of the um, excess of, you're thinking the perioxynitrate production? Well, no, the, the S nitrosylation. Uh, okay. Uh, that's going to be at the bottom of the chart here. I'll show you that when we get Perfect. down there. Now, the, remember I talked to you about the FXN is what takes the iron and brings it in. And look what happened. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. So if we look at a bell curve here, you can see you're at the end of the bell curve. Interesting. Now, yes. now tell me real practically again, is that getting excessive iron? I, I already have the hemochromatosis mutation, so I'm going to accumulate more iron. And this is actually keeping it intracellularly or where? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. In other words, it's going to keep it intracellularly. And I, uh, if I can find the slide. Um, maybe I'll pull that in. Let me see if I can pull the slide in just for that. I know I have it here. It's not uh, too far down my list. And there it is. So let me pull this slide over here. Well, and as you're pulling up, I'll tell you a little clinical scenario. So years and years ago, I had Crohn's, which is completely in remission and gone now. But with the Crohn's, of course, you can have some um, malabsorption and nutrient depletion. And I would actually show up as anemic because of that, which is interesting because I actually have always genetically had this hemochromatosis variant and probably accumulated intracellular iron at a higher level. And I'm just saying that because again, if you're a clinician or you're a patient, you could actually be iron excessive, iron toxic and have iron creating the rust inside your cells and look anemic on. And again, that's kind of a difficult thing because when it gets really low, you still need iron to survive. But that's uh, any thoughts on that process of how someone could actually be hemochromatosis, um, one mutation or two or more, and have this issue with iron overload and also be anemic or borderline? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the chart that we have up here now, you'll see when you got this mutation in FXN, the iron doesn't come over here to make the iron sulfur yes. complex. It goes inside the cell and makes oxidative stress and got mitochondrial it. impairment. But then also, if you have uh, hydrogen peroxide that's not cleared... You know, that will, uh, that will, uh, see if we have anything real quick here on that. If we don't clear the hydrogen peroxide, by catalase, glutathione, and thiodoxin, here comes your iron and mm -hmm. makes it as well. So you can overabsorb the iron, go through these processes, and be anemic. And some people just can't get their head around that. Well, I can't be overabsorbing iron because of anemic. 
Yes. I mean, it sounds like an oxymoron, but it can. Okay. I love that you said that. And I wonder how many, do you see, you're seeing, you know, consulting genetics on people. Do you see a lot of people who are insistent on, they need their iron and you're looking at their chart and saying, no, please don't take that. Yeah. yeah. Some, some, some rather sad cases as well, yes. where their where their physician, uh, mm -hmm. like their, their uh, nephrologist says, I don't care what genetics they have. They're low in iron and don't want to hear anything about it while their kidneys are being destroyed. But um, yes. Um, so anyway, for you, I don't know how, I don't think this is a big deal, but with these FXNs here, there's the possibility that the um, that the iron is not getting up here. And then if it does get up here, you're having a hard time making that iron sulfur cluster, potentially. Again, genetics is just yeah. a predisposition. So here's your, uh, here's your cysteine. And uh, we spoke about the, uh, the cysteine that um, if you get this, nitric oxide that's aberrant so again let's go back to the nitric oxide uh -huh. it can combine with oxygen to make superoxide as you can see we're just filling this in at this point there's nothing in these yeah. guys Definitely. but this is the uh the cgmp where you uh, make the nitric oxide and then we want to dig into the uh the pde5 because you know viagra and cialis yes. what they do is they, they shut that down so the questions we're exploring is what environmentally or genetically might stimulate the PDE5? Um, that'll be, I don't know if we'll find anything, but that would be fascinating to, to look at. Yeah. So what we've got to do is we've got to get the nitric oxide to come down this pathway, not this pathway, and not the aberrant nitric oxide. So you can see here that if your cysteine gets uh, nitrosylated, you've got a little weakness on the thyroidoxin enzyme. See the twos here? Uh-huh. It would take it from nitrosylated back. And then if you go this way, you've got the ADH5 also mutated. That uh, There's one here that's uh, evidence-based that you're not going to go down and, and recycle. So much more to learn here. And then, of course, the uh, if you're exposed to, to mold uh, or virus, we stimulate the NMDA. Mm -hmm. It stimulates the excess calcium that stimulates your NOS 1, 2, and 3, which is going to then make excess potentially nitric oxide, and then some of it may become aberrant and become and uh, affect your uh, theols, which is then going to affect your glutathione. production of glutathione. Fascinating. Yeah. Bob, as always, you put the puzzle together and you keep working tirelessly to bring us as clinicians great information. Um, if you're watching and you're a clinician, um, go back, rewind, make sure and get Bob's information. I highly recommend um, if you want to learn more. This is a really, really great um, educational program that helps you fine tune those really complex chronic patients that we all see. And I find these are the kind of things that are the one in a million or one in a thousand or those unique characteristics that really do move the needle. Um, mm -hmm. And as we do personalized precision medicine, we need to um, find these details to really help the patients. So Absolutely. I'm saying that to say thank you for your brilliant work and for all that you've done um, in the many episodes before and even today. I always learn something new. Yes. Well, it's a, it's a lot of fun and we're uh... There's much, much more to learn. So again, if anyone wants to contact us, there's Tree of Life, clinicians only, please. Yeah. Um, there's the there's the software that they can use. Now, as you can tell, the software is not for the faint of heart. Yes. It's, uh, this yeah. isn't a um, printout of do this. <laughs> it's, for the, it's for the serious clinician um, who's willing to do some homework. So it's It's amazing. And Bob, once again, just publicly, I am so grateful for your work in this field and for the times that you come on and, and talk with me about this stuff. It is so much fun. As, um, as always, today has been another great episode and I know people will benefit. And just thank you for the tireless work that you put out there. We all appreciate you. Absolutely. And as soon as we know what to do for F FXN or the uh, iron sulfur clusters, you will be the first to know. And next episode. <laughs> so stay tuned, everyone. Thanks yeah. again, Bob. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah.